Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books. And Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are so excited to be here with two of our other favorite feminist bookstores, Violet Valley Books, which is owned by uh, Jamie Harker, who's our conversation partner tonight, and Burdock Book Collective. So Violet Valley Books um, makes feminist, queer, and multicultural books available to the Water Valley community, the state of Mississippi, and the South. The bookstore provides a series of readings and other programs to support diverse voices in Mississippi, features new and used books so that everyone, no matter their income bracket, can afford to have books. And Burdock Book Collective aims to create radically inclusive community building and political organizing space in Birmingham, Alabama. In addition, they curate intersectional feminist literature written by authors of different identities and life experiences while centering and uplifting marginalized voices. So we're so glad to have um, two of our favorite Southern feminist bookstores. We didn't, for a long time, we were lonesome. We had an interim of lonesomeness uh, where we were the only Southern bookstore uh, for a bit. And now we have a robust collective of feminist bookstores in the South. But we're here today with Dr. Alex Ketchum to celebrate the brand new book, Ingredients for Revolution, A History of American Feminist Restaurants, Cafes, and Coffee Houses. And this is a study of feminist restaurants in the United States from 1972 to the present. We are really, really excited about this because, of course, feminist restaurants have sort of a parallel history to feminist bookstores. It makes so much sense for us to be discussing these things together. So since 2018, Dr. Alex Ketchum has been the faculty lecturer for the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. She is the director of Just Feminist Tech and Scholarship Lab and the organizer of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Tech Speaker and Workshop Series. Her work integrates food, environmental, technological, and gender history. Ketchum's first peer-reviewed book, Engage in Public Scholarship, a guidebook on feminist and accessible communication examines the power dynamics that impact who gets to create certain kinds of academic work and for whom these outputs are accessible. Coinciding with the 50th anniversary of the trailblazing restaurant Mother Courage of New York City, Ketchum's second book, Ingredients for Revolution, is the book that we are celebrating here tonight. You can find out more about her writing and pot, including podcasts, zines, exhibitions, and more at her website, which I'll put in the chat. Um, she's joined again by Jamie Harker, who is the professor of English and the director of the Sarah Isom Center for Women and Gender Studies at the University of Mississippi, where she teaches American literature, LGBTQ literature, and gender studies. She is the author of American Middlebrow Women's Novels, Progressivism, and Middlebrow Authorship Between the Wars, and Middlebrow Queer, Christopher Isherwood in America. She's also the co-editor of The Oprah Effect, Critical Essays on Oprah's Book Club, 1960s Gay Pulp Fiction, The Misplaced Heritage, This Book is in Action, Feminist Print Culture and Activist Aesthetics, Faulkner and Print Culture, and The Lesbian South, Southern Feminists, The Women in Print Movement, and The Queer Literary Canon. She is also the founder of Violet Valley Bookstore, a queer feminist bookstore in, in Water Valley, Mississippi. So welcome to you both. Welcome to everybody who's here with us today watching. We're so glad y'all are here. You may ask questions at any time in the chat or in the ask a question box, and we will um, incorporate those. And, you know, part of this, uh, it's Women's History Month, and we're thinking a lot about storytelling. So feel free to share your stories in the chat, too. If you were there at any of these places, Mev Miller has started us out talking about being at Bloodroot. Um, we'd love to hear it. So kick us off um, in, the, in the chat with anything you want to share. Um, but for now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send it over to Jamie. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Thanks so much. What a pleasure to be here. I love ER. Uh, ER many years ago was a student in my very first graduate seminar and somehow survived it without too much harm. So thanks for that. Uh, Alex, it's such a pleasure to get to meet you, if only virtually. I love this book. I love this project. I can't wait to talk about it. Thank you. I'm really excited to dive in. All right. So please, everyone, don't be shy. If you have memories, if you have questions, we're going to plan to talk for, I have a few questions back and forth, 30, 35 minutes, but if you've got stuff you want to say, we want to bring you into the conversation. So don't be shy. Well, let me just start with the kind of background. How did you get interested in the history of feminist restaurants? 
Yeah, so I've been working on this project for 12 years. So when I was an undergraduate at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut, I was a co-organizer of the school's organic farm long lane. It was student run. And I had founded a living community on campus called Farmhouse, which was a food politics house. And I was taking feminist studies courses, history studies courses, and I want to bring these interests together for my uh, undergraduate honors thesis. And I was thinking about these questions around uh, what was called kind of unremunerated domestic food production, but basically unpaid cooking and cleaning in the household, you know, buying the food, prepping it, and the interest that feminist writers had in the kind of early 1970s about this. You know, there are a lot of satire pieces about the why, Judy Cipher's Why I Want a Wife, and those kind of pieces really focusing on this cooking problem, as it was called. But I was also questioning, you know, I love to cook, I really cared about food politics, but I also saw the kind of uh, images that we saw in food justice movements that would have, you know, men farming and women cooking, even like, like slow food kind of um, literature. So I want to give historical context for my critiques of food movements. And I was really thinking about this, writing about this. And then someone mentioned, hey, have you ever heard of Bloodroot? It's this feminist restaurant that's existed since the 70s and it's just on the road in Bridgeport. So I convinced some of my friends to drive me. It's about 45 minutes away from Middletown. And I went to Bloodroot Feminist Vegetarian Restaurant and Bookstore and was instantly just so fascinated about this space, about its history. So I spent a little bit of my undergrad thesis talking about Bloodroot and also Bread and Roses, which was a feminist bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And when I was thinking about what I would do, my master's work in, here in Canada, I moved to Canada for my master's. I decided to look at Canadian feminist restaurants. And then my PhD project was American and Canadian feminist restaurants. And then the book is the American ones. So it, my kind of desire to work on this came from personal experiences, interest in food politics, feminist politics, and then just how excited I was about these restaurants and what they were making of uh, this kind of cooking question around food and gender and creating space. And especially as I came to find, it was really about creating kind of lesbian space or as we might call it today, kind of like queer women's space. This is so cool. It's interesting how many of those like early encounters kind of fuel those later obsessions. You know, I can mm -hmm. remember in college going to Cafe Haven in Orem, Utah, which was, a uh, cafe and then they had a teeny little like three shelf bookstore section that started me on all that interest so that is very cool, oh, that's so cool. yeah uh, so you know that so let me just dive in i know that you work on it for this long you probably got more stories than you you have time for the next two hours but just for people who may not have studied this as much um can you give us two or three kind of stories or anecdotes about feminist restaurants that maybe either got you first interested or really struck you when you started to research this yeah, I think they're kind of like poignant moments of uh, stories that feminist restaurant founders shared with me. So I'll try to kind of spread them geographically. So um, I mentioned Bread and Roses and one of the anecdotes, so it was started by Patricia Hines. Um, and one of the stories about like what they were imagining for the space, right? They wanted feminist space. They wanted a space where people primarily women could go and not be harassed for eating by themselves. And there was a story of one woman who would go and she would just sit there for a few hours once a week. And it was her only time where she could just have quiet and she got to just like read her books. Whereas there's other stories about just how important these spaces were culturally. So uh, for those of you who know Alex Dobkin, women's musician, lesbian musician, touring musician, one way I actually found these spaces was looking at the touring schedules of women's musicians, like part of the women's music movement, women's musicians. And it's amazing to look in her personal archives, their house at the Schlesinger uh, archives, uh, Schlesinger Library and Archives. And you can just see her correspondence with the um, owners of these spaces, the people running them about um, many of them, they would have like a show at the restaurant and then there would maybe be some like kind of socializing in the space. And then later there would also be like a potluck housed at someone else's house, you know? So it was, food was always there. It was a way to bring people to 
physical space that was this kind of community center restaurant. And then there was this kind of other personal side. And usually she would also stay with other people in the community too. So that was pretty cool. Um, then there's places where, so the book itself is divided into three parts. The first part focuses on restaurants and cafes, the second on coffee houses, and then the third part, these spaces after 1989. And I bring this up because the coffee houses allow me to tell different kinds of stories. So, uh, for example, there is a tiny coffee house in a small town in Minnesota, which happened in a cookie bakery after hours because it was like the only space where especially lesbians in that community could meet. Many of them are school teachers. So it was one of the times where they could uh, be out be with other lesbians or questioning women or women who are like supportive of them and they weren't at risk of losing their jobs and being found out. Uh, and then there's also spaces that I kind of touch on it a bit in the book, but I'm really, so for folks who don't know the way I'm defining feminist restaurants is that I didn't want to be the one saying like, this is feminist, this isn't feminist. I didn't want to be that prescriptive. I was interested in places that called themselves specifically feminist. So either in their title, in their marketing, or if it came up in interviews, in any of the kind of stuff that they produced. But um, to do so, to build this kind of directory that I have in the book and this uh, larger directory I have on my website also at thefeministrestaurantproject.com, I had to use a lot of methods to find these spaces. And one of it was looking at women's travel guides, which were essentially lesbian travel guides and also gay guides. And I bring this up because uh, for one of the, the places that was listed in guides, not all of them would be feminist spaces, but there are places that were, um, I couldn't necessarily include them in the book because they didn't fit the definition. But for example, there was a Denny's in a tiny town in Florida that was like, here's where we all hang out, you know? And it's not that the owner was a lesbian. It's not that the Denny's knew it was that place, right? But there's also these kind of informal spaces. So while my book is looking more at the kind of formalized spaces because I wanted to know what were the stakes for calling it explicitly feminist? What did the owners or founders of these kinds of spaces mean by that? And why did they choose to use that term versus kind of social justice or other terminology that they could use? They're still part of this larger network of also informal spaces as well. Um, and the spaces are spread across the United States. So basically every Every U.S. state at some point had a feminist restaurant or a coffee house, um, which were these like, again, these kind of impermanent spaces um, in the 1970s or 1980s. So um, I kind of have like anecdotes throughout, but um, I can continue to go on, but I'll, maybe we can move to the next question. And I'm happy yeah, to absolutely. continue talking. Keep this coming, by the way. I'm just smiling, want to wave at my friend Julie Earhart, who does a lot with food studies and, and is here. And I'm hoping she'll throw in a question as we go along. Um, there's so much to follow up, by the way. The whole stuff about those impermanent kind of queering spaces that are not you know, fixed, that, that may be a next book, because that's a that's a fun. <laughs> I was noticing in your your book, Queers in Space from the 90s, which is really fun about the ways that certain areas become queer at certain times of the day or nights mm -hmm. or in certain areas. So, not that you need more projects to do, but that that's a really cool topic. Um, so much to follow up on. I think I'm going to jump to this one because you mentioned the idea of, of women's music and, mm -hmm. and that trend. One of the things I really enjoyed about this book is how it places feminist restaurants within this larger ecosystem of feminist activism, presses, women's music, other kinds of cultural interventions. Um, how does understanding feminist restaurants within that larger context change how we understand this movement? Yeah, I think, okay, so there's a few ways that it kind of shifts it. One, I think, is that importance on food, right? Like I mentioned the idea of the cooking problem, and I think there is this tension a lot of feminists have, or at least had, and folks kind of think of this tension around food, right? Like does food mean domesticity? Does it mean oppression? Or does it mean creating a community gathering space, right? Like this idea of women cooking is kind of like this point of tension, I would say, in kind of these histories of um, kind of feminist businesses and feminist spaces, especially in the 1970s and 1980s kind of um, histories. And so I think my book kind of shows how food could actually be so much a part of this feminism in really formalized ways. So I think that's one sense. I think also, um, you know, it's not a 
completely different history than feminist bookstores, right? So I also include in this book and in the directory bookstores if they sold like coffee or tea or food or snacks, because that still created a space to linger, right? Like it still invited people to kind of gather around, sit around, drink a cup of coffee, linger, and like share books, right? So and like I mentioned before, right, Bloodroot was both a restaurant and a bookstore, and it continues to exist today for folks who are interested in uh, visiting. It was founded in 1977, so 46 years ago, but you can still check it out. So I think there's that component of it. I think it also um, kind of expands some of the conversations we have, too, about what it means to be a feminist business. And I don't hear mean that kind of, like, feminist business sense that we've seen, especially over the past decade of kind of like a girl boss feminism, you know, that's like hyper capitalist, but instead that these businesses also point to a lot of the challenges of trying to live out your values, run a business while under capitalism, right? And so that's not to say you can't do that same kind of study by looking at bookstores, you totally can. Um, and that's an important component of it. But I think in part, my like research on this book too, my obsession of reading through tax records and, you know, business ledgers and all of that. I think because of that kind of obsession, and also because sometimes that was the only record left over. I think that's an important kind of contribution um, to it. And because food too, like it spoils really fast. It, the restaurant business industry is really difficult. It also kind of transforms those conversations. That is really cool. I'll just put this out as a general call. Those looking for research, like looking at business records and all of that work, there's so much information that you can really cull from that. Um, all right, let me let me follow up. There's a couple of definitions I wanted to dig in. So, yeah, so one sure. was, you know, you're doing looking at self-identification, but what what makes food feminists? And you can give us some examples from a number of different places. Yeah. You don't give us the definitive answer, but how, how is food feminist in these in these configurations? Yeah, for sure. So again, right, like self-definition, but so for, I'll first give the examples of restaurants who didn't see food as integral to their feminism. There are a couple of spaces I talk about in the book, like Susan B's in Chicago, where a group of lesbians had worked really hard to try to like refurbish a space. They worked day after day after day. And the night before the person who was kind of running the restaurant was like, it was supposed to be a soup restaurant. And the night before she said, ah, does anyone know how to make soup? You know, like it wasn't the point. It was just to create a space to gather and soup is cheap and you can make it in bulk. And so in that way, food was supporting the feminist goal, but it wasn't so much about the soup. Now there are restaurants that I talk about in the book where food is so integral to their feminism. So um, part of it is like, there's kind of trends of eco-feminism within this where it's seen the exploitation of animals and the environment as being linked to the oppression and exploitation of women. So in that sense. And so they really want to have vegetarian recipes. And later on, some of these restaurants become more and more vegan. Um, a lot of them are really interested in seeing this kind of worker solidarity with cooking food so that the um, people, the farm workers and the people kind of producing the raw ingredients are paid properly for their food, that they're treated well. And that if there's strikes like the Gallo grape strikes or with the, like Anita Bryant campaigns with her citrus campaign, like they wouldn't sell oranges, right? They want to be in solidarity um, and also like the tied kind of meanings of food. So that's the one hand, right? So the sourcing of the ingredients, so vegetarian and in solidarity. There were ones that weren't vegetarian, but there's the ones that were vegetarian, they're usually vegetarian very explicitly for a very specific reason. Then there's trying to make sure that the people who are working in the restaurant are properly compensated and treated well, and that they're going to challenge hierarchies of traditional restaurants. So this usually meant, but not always, that there wouldn't be waitresses or waiters, but instead that people would kind of um, get their food from a counter, clean up after themselves. Um, there would usually be large windows onto the kitchen so people could see the labor that was being done. We might call it an open concept kitchen today, but they, they weren't calling it that. The point was that you had, you would actually see the labor behind your food. Um, and a lot of the goals, now some of this was like what they aimed for. It didn't mean that they all accomplished this, but that people would be paid what we would call today a living wage for their work. Um, in a space where they could be out as lesbians, where they could be out as feminists, right, living out their values. 
Um, not all of them are lesbians, but many of them were. I, I'm just going to clarify that for the definition of like who started these spaces and who they're for, but um, that they could live their true identities in this space. So farm workers, sourcing of products, vegetarian, then you have, I'm pointing, I'm creating like a visual triangle here, <laughs> then like people in this space. Um, and the other part of it is making sure that um, people who want to actually come to the space can afford it, right? And so, you know, we're looking at um, issues of um, like, oftentimes these spaces are targeting um, women as customers and a lot of times working class and middle class women as customers. So you're, and women are usually paying less, like especially in the 70s and 80s, but even today. So that means that you have to have food that's excessively priced. That is really hard to balance, right? So you're trying to make sure the people creating the food are paid well, the workers in the restaurant are paid well, and you're having low cost things. So all of those components are about being feminist, but that's a really challenging thing. Some of them are able to make it work by having things like sliding scale dishes or pay what you can dishes or like the soup of the day would be very cheap, right? So people could enter the space and socialize without paying a lot of money um, or you could kind of train labor for food type of thing. Um, so there are a lot of components to this. There are also components in terms of like what you call dishes. So there are some places that were like, this omelet is named after a feminist figure. This like, you know, cup of coffee for the day, we're going to call that special coffee mixture after feminist figures. And we still see that kind of marketing today as well. Um, so like Lagusta is Luscious, which is a feminist, vegan, anarchist chocolate shop. And there's also a cafe located in New Paltz, New York, and also New York City. Um, you know, like she still names chocolates after feminist figures. That's like part of her business model. Um, and the other thing too, is that for many of the restaurants, they're also trying to represent the cultures of the people working in the restaurant. So while many of these restaurants were founded, um, prim the restaurants were founded primarily, but not exclusively by white working class and middle class lesbians, uh, many of whom identified as kind of socialist feminists or radical feminists, but more socialist feminists actually, um, many of whom are Jewish, like more than the, like a disproportionate percentage compared to the general population, but not exclusively so, right? There was a bit of diversity in ownership. Um, but many of the people who also worked at these spaces, if they weren't part of offering collectives, also came from a variety of backgrounds and they brought those backgrounds into the cooking. So for example, Carol, who works at Bloodroot today, um, is uh, from Jamaica or her family's Jamaican. And so she brings in like Jamaican jerk recipes into like vegan cooking, right? And so that's like some of her like dishes are really, really popular, right? So it's people bringing in food from their cultural heritage. Um, yeah, so being feminist in food can be really complicated. Um, and sometimes it was just, again, like food as a way of creating space, but it has been really interesting for the folks I was able to interview about their dishes and stuff, because, you know, some people have passed away, right, when you're looking at places founded in the 70s. But um, the folks I was able to interview, a lot of them thought really, really, um, really thoughtfully about why they wanted to name it, like feminist food, what that meant for them. And it was usually not just like, oh, like we might just make a restaurant. It was usually like food was integral to their feminism. And if folks are looking for, I want to speak about more than just one space, but it's easy to talk about Bloodroot because they still exist today. Um, and they've been around for so long, so they've just produced so much. Um, but their cookbook, The Political Palette, which I actually have. Oops, I want to grab a copy. Okay, so they produced like nine cookbooks or so, but this is their first one. And you'll notice it's actually kind of the model of my own cover for my book. But um, in it, they have like, it's a cookbook arranged seasonally, but the first part kind of is a political manifesto and this long introduction in which they say really explicitly, our food is feminist and this is why we see it as feminist, you know? So people are looking for like a really good cookbook written in 1980 with vegetarian recipes that all work as described, I recommend it. So I, I know I kind of rambled a bit there, but food is definitely a huge part of uh, feminist restaurants.
Okay, so I just have to put that on my want list here. Um, nice. Yeah, cool. you can, they have a lot. They've like a lot of the recipes are repeated in their kind of later. They have like the best of Bloodroot volumes one and two also um, that they co wrote with Augusta Yearwood because she actually did her stage, uh, her uh, culinary stage during culinary school at Bloodroot. So um, yeah. I'm going to be doing a follow up with you for my list of, of you know, building my sort of rare book feminist. Um, <laughs> Recipe collection, this will be fun. This may be something you reach out to. Um, so also I have a list of, I'm gonna be using your map for my road tripping plans in the future because that sounds excellent. And finally, uh, Leslie said this in the chat, but I too would like an omelet named after me. So we <laughs> have life goals of like dishes at famous restaurants. Uh, very cool. So let me ask about the business part because as you were describing this, right? You've got all of these um, very idealistic and, you know, progressive goals. And then you have the reality of how do you keep things open? And I guess this sort of combination of thinking about how do you combine the feminist part, which may not be about turning a profit and the mm -hmm. business part, which is needing to make enough to pay expenses, pay people fairly and still make it accessible. And this may connect to another question, which is, does this relate to why many feminist restaurants didn't make it to a 40th anniversary like but can you talk a little bit about those pressures of balancing yeah. the business part of the feminist business yeah for sure so um there's kind of a few ways to answer this because some of them closed the earlier ones that were founded kind of in the earlier 70s um in part because of going in with um less of a background in the restaurant industry and less of a background in businesses so if you look at Mother Courage, which was founded in 1972, right, that's prior to the passage of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act in 1974. So like women can get credit cards in their own name. You know, it's like really hard to start a business if you can't get a line of credit unless it's in your husband's and father's name. And you might not be married if you're an out lesbian. Right. Um, and your family might not want to help you start a feminist or a lesbian feminist restaurant. So that's going to be really difficult. And so many of these restaurants try to compensate um, or fundraise. Some people would use some of their personal savings. They would host dances. They would try to get like donations from the community. They would have kind of like pop-up events to fundraise in advance. And they would also get kind of micro loans from other community members. But this usually meant that they were starting off already economically precarious, right? You know, they had enough to open their doors, but if they had a bad week, they could be in trouble. The other challenge was that a lot of people started these places off in the earlier 70s with a lot of idealism, and they didn't necessarily come in with backgrounds of working in the restaurant industry or managing a business in like any other form. Um, and so when you like talk to the people who started these earlier ones, or you look at their business records or things that they told journalists at the time, many of them reflected that they wish they had had a lawyer at the start. They wished they had an accountant at the start, right? They didn't like go in with this. They're thinking we're going to run this collectively. For some of the places such as Common Woman Club in Northampton, Massachusetts, they actually wanted to shift who was doing each job every week. So one person or the food one week, and then this person would cook breakfast that week. And, you know, and that's great on the one hand, because it means that like everyone's involved with different work and that no one is stuck always doing the dishes. But on the other hand, it could be a little chaotic, right? Um, and it requires a lot of trust. So for places like the Common Woman Club, you know, within the first 18 months, they had so much burnout. They were not able to pay their bills. And it led to them, um, the initial collective closing. Another collective took it on and came in having kind of that prior knowledge um, and had more of like a business plan moving forward. So um, that was kind of one of the reasons. Another reason, like many of the places closed, was just like kind of changes in the economy. You have, you know, the rise of Reaganism. Then you have kind of like 90s closure of a lot of small businesses in the early 90s. So um, that's one of the challenges. And then also the restaurant industry is really hard and really tiring. Um, there's some cases where places didn't necessarily need to close economically, but people are just so burnt out and tired and they're just like, I can't do this anymore. For some folks, it was kind of an experiment in living out their values. And after a certain point, they're like, okay, we've done this. Um, but I wouldn't say any of these are failures. I think uh, just because things close and end doesn't mean that they failed. So for example, the Brick Hut 
cafe, um, there were three locations over time. So not that they had three spots open simultaneously, but they changed locations around um, Berkeley. So Bay Area, California. And so they're around for like a couple decades, but they eventually closed um, due to like economic hardship. But they've been closed since the 90s. And yet there's a Facebook group, a Remembering the Brick Hut Cafe Facebook group, where people still talk about the home fries that they ate there. And they share their memories and they talk about memories of like carrying their friends who were passing away from complications of HIV AIDS and to have their last meal in the space because that was like where they saw their family and their friends there. And so like these spaces were really important to people. You don't often have remembrance pages for restaurants that closed decades ago, you know? And we can also see the impact that they've had on new generations of feminist spaces. I mentioned, right, that Lagusta Yearwood did her kind of like stage, culinary stage at Bloodroot. And even though in her businesses, you know, they're less lesbian, they're more queer, um, they're like some of the politics of the restaurant are a bit different or, or her cafes and uh, chocolate businesses are a little bit different, but right, like she still learned um, from that generation, um, still talks to them, has chocolates named after uh, Selma, Miriam, and Noel Fury, right? So you see this kind of like change over time. And like also, you know, the challenges today with running these uh, cafes and cafe bookstores and stuff are just going to be different because of kind of differences in the economy, price points of certain ingredients and foods. So I think they're facing new challenges and new problems, but ones who closed weren't failures. Um, they definitely had really important impacts on the people who went there. And when I had the um, ability to listen to tapes of community meetings of people who ran these collectives, because some collectives would put a tape recorder in the middle of the room and just randomly record like one or two meetings, but I've gotten to hear them if they like survived and made it to an archive. Um, you know, people are fighting about like, how are we going to make this space work? What are we going to do? Um, so I'm thinking of an example, Minneapolis. And but people, even though there's all these challenges, they care so much about trying to make it work because for them, that is like the space that their life's meaning was tied to. So even though that place also closed eventually, it still it still was important. I like that reminder that longevity is not the only measure of success and that the the people whose vision or a possibility was transformed by them really, really matters. And hopefully your book will lead people to have new dreams and new kind of visions. Um, I really want to think about like what's happening today. But before we do, you've mentioned this a couple of times, um, which is, you know, queer women's history and how it intersects with feminist restaurants. Um, and it's a complicated question. I remember reading the feminist bookstore movement and, and a vast majority of people starting feminist bookstores were identified as lesbians. So can you talk a little bit about how those intersected, how how that definition of queer women's identity were part of this? Was it was it lesbians plus? Was it queer women and or how did that and it maybe was different at different times? So talk a little bit about that relationship. because I was think that's very interesting in women's space. Yeah, for sure. So I love this question, and it's also a super challenging one. For folks who read the book in the death in um, in the introduction, I talk about these different definitions of terms and how they're so challenging because even the use of the word woman has so many different meanings and understandings depending on the place and the space and the time that you're talking about, right? And so I talk about things in terms of like women in terms of W-O-M-E-N. And then once you use the Y and the W-I-M-M-I-N, right? Once you use the X, sometimes those um, spellings start to be trans inclusive. Sometimes they're supposed to be trans exclusive, right? Depending on which context you're talking about. So it can be really challenging. Sometimes woman is code for lesbian, right? And then there's a lot of debate, like, for places that call themselves women's coffee houses, are we actually for all women? Are we for lesbians? Why don't we just call ourselves lesbian? Then folks saying, well, this allows for space for people who are questioning or don't use that label, or not every queer woman wants to use the lesbian label. There's certain cultural connotations with that word, right? So there's so much debate, like you can see in people's writings and recordings and all of this from the time that I'm not even sure always that all the creators of these spaces knew fully what they meant. So they're trying to create terms that opened up the space for folks that they wanted to be in community with, 
but also the definitions never fully worked. And sometimes folks, they wanted to feel welcome, felt excluded, and people who maybe they didn't necessarily like, know if they want in this space also would feel included, right? So it's always challenging with the terminology. Um, you know, I meant this like intersecting of feminist history and queer women's history and lesbian history is again also a challenge, right? So, you know, my the lavender color has like a lot of kind of importance in terms of like kind of queer history, but also right, Betty Friedan, writer of feminine mystique, did not like how involved lesbian feminists were with the feminist movement, like especially in the 70s, and called lesbians the lavender menace, right? Um, you know, so there's rejection of lesbians in the movement, but of course, the lesbians were so key in doing a lot of really important organizational work, were key leaders in feminist movement, but also kind of challenged this politics of respectability. So the term feminist was open for like people who align themselves with like different um, like parts of feminism, had different sexual orientations. The other thing, right, is feminist is a very fraught term. There's so much debate, so many types of feminism, Marxist, anarchist, socialist, liberal, right? But if you were trying to run a restaurant, like you, it would, if you're like, we are a uh, Marxist feminist restaurant, that's really going to narrow your clientele ability versus like feminist, and then people can sit at a shared table and debate. So because especially for the restaurants, they needed to at least like invite in a larger amount of folks in order to be functional, like to be able to pay bills. There, I think they kind of benefited from some of this openness of terms. As a researcher, that's very challenging. Um, it also means that a lot of places were called full moon or Artemis, that's a really common name, or there was kind of like recurring names and with the coffee houses in the book, I use like the geographic location and the name of it too, when I'm referring to it, because there was a woman's coffee house, the woman's coffee house, woman's coffee house, you know? So it, the names kind of repeat sister coffee house, sister moon coffee house, sister, you know, it's like, he's so, um, right. And then also the term sister that itself is also really complicated too. And, you know, um, yeah, so it's it's a really complicated question, but uh, when I first started the project too, like I was out as bi and leader, like as queer, like, you know, throughout university. Um, but I also kind of, when I started the project, I was thinking really like feminist space, and then it really became, oh, this is also like very much like a queer history. But there's always this kind of joke that it's not research, it's me search, you know? And I realized like, oh, really deep into the project. And I'm talking like really deep. So I had started this in 2011 and lately, you know, starting the project in my undergrad. And it wasn't until like 2018 when I was finishing my PhD that I was like, oh, I was trying to write about places I wanted to go and wish for around me, you know? And then I was like, oh, that makes so much sense why I was so obsessed with this and how trying to even understand the terminology was also trying to understand myself. So, <laughs> yeah. That sound, I, I, I relate to this very much. I, I'm working on a book called Sapphic right now, which is this mm. thing about, you know, 21st century uh, queer women's writing. But I, I have a whole thing of my trips to feminist and lesbian bookstores. And one of them is wandering into Karis by accident. Mm -hmm. With my lesbian mother, <laughs> my my Mormon mother with her lesbian daughter, she knows she's lesbian yet, right? And my mother going, "What's with all these crystals and why?" <laughs> and me looking around, my eyes really big, going, "This is it! I found it!" Right? Yes. <laughs> but those, those moments of encounter, right, where you just wander in and you sense the space, right? They they have that. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it makes sense to me that when you found that that feminist restaurant, it it awakened an idea of an identity and a, a way to be in the world that you hadn't seen before. So, which is why this is sure. why physical yeah. spaces matter, right? Exactly. Like digital space is like important. And I also talk about that in the book of how these places like try to kind of project out into that digital space. But yeah, and also that like stump, that moment of stumbling upon as you talked about. Um, and, you know, it's funny to me, it took so long for it to fully dawn on me. Like I had been working on, I kind of understood that, but I didn't fully like 
you know, you can understand, but you can like later understand. And I even had an article, like an academic journal article called The Place You've Always Wanted to Go But Never Could Find. And it still didn't hit me, um, you know. And so um, I know you had had a like, question too about like stories I did, wasn't able to tell in the book. And that quote actually comes from Clementines, which is a place that they bought a location. It was associated with the um, lesbian organization in Toronto, Loot. Um, but it never actually got to fully open. So uh, I think the stories that I, I cut from the book, I made it all about the United States examples and not about the Canadian one. So if you go to my website, thefeministrestaurantproject.com, you'll also see in the directory and maps, the Canadian examples as well. I cut them from the book because it was, uh, the book has to touch on different parts of legal history and to have to deal with the legal histories of two different like national contexts, as well as provincial and state and municipal. It was just a lot of kind of legal and tax history. And it was just more the restaurants were in the state. So that's why I focus on it. But if folks are interested in kind of Canadian examples, um, I have open access versions of all my articles that are linked on my uh, website as well. There's just so much to do. This could be, you know, the rest of your career. You may want to do other things, but there's lots, <laughs> lots to keep mining. Um, I'm smiling at the at the link of my my Burdock Book Collective buddies here, um, who also went to Karis a lot. I mean, I went to Karis for the first time ten years before I got the job at the University of Mississippi. Like it was just I was visiting my parents who moved to Atlanta and found it. It was just meant to be. So I was I was meant to to fall in ER's orbit eventually, which is good. Um, I just Thank want you. to mention to folks at uh, there. Are Please enter questions. We're we're talking and enjoying it, but we want to leave space for you to come in and, and chat with us. Let me just ask one kind of final question, and mm -hmm. hope people will join in the conversation. Are mm -hmm. we seeing kind of resurgence of, and I'm going to use different terms, feminist restaurants, queer restaurants, other kinds of collective or collaborative restaurants? Do you see a new kind of movement happening right now? Yeah, for sure. So the eighth chapter of the book talks about like what's happened since 1989, but we really see kind of an upswell again around kind of 2015, kind of the rise of Trump um, and that like rise of new conservative movements or at least like more explicitly. And so as a result of that, there there I mean, there are always a lot of social justice restaurants, social justice spaces, but there is kind of new stakes that some folks are finding in really explicitly labeling their restaurants, their food businesses, their eateries, and their bookstores also, right, as feminist. So we kind of see the rise of a lot of kind of in the mid-20-teens, like new spaces. Um, they're a bit different uh, because, of course, new generations, new kind of economic contexts, the ideas around feminism have shifted. Um, and so you see a lot of like new uh, feminist cafes slash bookstores, which um, like Butter had always had books, but this gives like multiple streams of revenue, adds a bit more stability um, into them. So you see uh, Fulton Books in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, you see uh, Cafe Con Libros in New York. Uh, Firestorm's a bit older, but Firestorm, apparently now they're not functioning as a cafe also, but they were for a while, right? So um, you see um, uh, in Elk Grove, California, um, a seat at the table book, sorry, I was blanking on the name for a second, a seat at the table books, which is also sells coffee, right? So you see this, there's a lot of places that are like cafe slash bookstores that are kind of coming up. Um, and then there's a lot of kind of, uh, so those are for physical space that's more permanent. And then you have a bunch of kind of like labeled feminist kind of pop-up shops or kind of food themed places. So like, and then there's also feminist food related businesses. So overseas in Amy, I'm wearing one of her sweatshirts. She has a lot of sweatshirts and stuff that has like food and feminist messages, like smash the garlic and the patriarchy, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I'd say they're a bit different. They tend to be more queer rather than lesbian centered. Like pretty much all of them are super trans inclusive. Um, yeah, and they tend to be they tend to be run by more women of color, um, whereas the earlier ones tend to be run by women and by white women and um, Jewish women. So these are, I mean, as you describe them, they're they're truer to sort of those intersectional roots of. of mm -hmm. what meant to be than maybe some of the early iterations were. I, I, it's fun to see all this new energy and excitement coming through. 
as definitely well. yeah yeah I, I want to ask you a random question which is okay. there, there are two i was thinking of and again the people do this all the time so tell me to be quiet if i'm going on but i'm thinking about biscuit bitch which is a restaurant in seattle do you know it have you heard of it and it's very invested in um you know making sure that the employees are well paid and make sure they have you know there's a whole thing in their in their website about making sure they have health care and that's part of that work and then slutty vegan in mm -hmm. Atlanta, which are interestingly like they're not necessarily putting feminist in the title but in different mm -hmm. ways kind of incorporating that and i'm wondering you know when you get away from whether they self-identify as feminist but you think about these broader principles and this will drive you crazy trying to categorize but it's really fun to watch that evolution yeah for sure no i mean like so that's one of the things that's really challenging and why I went with the self-identified because it was interesting. Like, why are they like making that choice to mark themselves in that way? But also it was to make this like a feasible project because if it was just like social justice principles that include feminism, but not explicitly named as feminist. Oh my goodness. But then it's like so sprawling and it kind of, yeah. Like one of the examples from kind of the earlier ones that, kind of pose that initial problem. Like I spent years trying to figure out like, how am I going to narrow this down? And one was looking at like Moosewood in Ithaca, New York, because people are like, does it count? Molly Katzen has these books. And I was like, a lot of cool social justice stuff going on, but they like don't use the term. Then there's the challenge too, because people ask like, okay, well, what about bars? So I even have to define like what I mean as a restaurant. And it can be really hard if the only thing I have is one leftover business card and an ephemera pile in a like LGBTQ archive or like a listing in a travel guide. But you know, restaurants sometimes are bar restaurants. Some bars have a lot of food. What about pubs? You know, that's really complicated. But the history of kind of like lesbian bars is a bit of a different history than what I'm doing. An important history that other people have written great books about. But that wasn't like the goal of this book. And the kind of question of alcohol with these restaurants is also kind of like its own challenge. Um, which I can get into later if folks want me to. But yeah, there's this question. I went to a place called Dear Annie's um, recently in Cambridge, Massachusetts, because um, I was down there uh, last week or two weeks ago. And it's a feminist wine bar, but they have like a really large menu. And I'm like, oh, and they say feminist on their website and they say everywhere, wine bar, wine bar, wine bar. I'm like, do I put it on the list? Do I not put it on the list? You know, I have this kind of asterisk system and you'll notice with the map there's ones that i was like sure we're feminist and ones that might have been but i can't guarantee and I'm like what do i do with these kinds of spaces you know they're marketing themselves as a wine bar but wow they this you you know like it's always really complicated definitions are really really hard um you know when you're trying to do something that's so sprawling over 50 years and you know people take the word feminist in a lot of different ways they take the word queer in a lot of different ways um and for folks who are interested in kind of this question too, I know we're talking specifically about this book and I talk about cookbooks in it and how these um, restaurants produce their own cookbooks and we're tied to this literary culture. But I also um, curated an exhibit um, two years ago about queer cookbooks um, that I can pop the link to in the chat if folks are interested in um, because like queerness and food in those links, like I talk about in the book, but also ones that are also for um, folks who aren't part of like the queer women's community and lesbian community, um, but especially like gay male culture and cookbooks as well, right? So um, lots of stuff there. I and also thank that. you everyone for all these comments in the chat. I've been reading them and it's so cool that some of you worked at Bloodroot, some of you go to Bloodroot frequently. That's so cool. So we do have a question uh, I wanna pass on. Uh, this is from Leslie Lopez, a question for Alex what would you sell in your hypothetical restaurant coffee shop etc oh if i were to operate my own okay <laughs> so that's kind of like a challenge because you know people ask me all the time would i start a feminist restaurant and i have to say after reading the business records of a lot of folks <laughs> i'm not sure how keen i am to start one i have so much respect for the people who do um like operate these spaces because it is so much work. It's so much sweat, um, time. Um, I love food and I love cooking for people, but I also worry that in doing it in a restaurant space, it would really, uh, it would just be overwhelming. But I do have these kinds of fantasies of having, I started getting really into making scones. There's this place in Detroit 
called Sister Pie that I've actually never gone to go to, but they're also one of those challenging places. Like they're what they call a triple bottom line business. So they're interested in uh, people, profit, and place. So it's not just about profit. It's making sure that their community is cared for, the people who work there. And they have a lot of feminist principles, but they're not like using that word. So again, it's on those tricky places, but I've gotten really into baking their scone recipes. And so, yeah, sometimes I fantasize about having a scone bookshop, like feminist bookshop <laughs> cafe. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's when uh, those are on the days when I'm just like, ah, oh, more grading. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if I told you this, but my wife is a chef. And so I have seen up close um, just how difficult the business is. So I, I understand what you're saying of the fantasy of it and the reality. But, you know, imagine you had, say, a steak of something or, you know, a collective had provided it with you. Mm -hmm. I, I told you this. I, I had your book uh, at the bookstore on my, you know, when I was open a couple of weeks ago and someone had driven up from Jackson, which is about two hours away and is in a collective, a restaurant collective in Jackson called Sunflower. And they were about to leave, saw your book and had to buy it and ran back. So <laughs> I'm very excited that it's now kind of uh, circulating as we go. Um, you do have one That's more question. Uh, they wanted to know the name of the early feminist cookbook you mentioned. I think it was. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll put it near the screen too if people wanna see it. So it's called The Political Palette. This is the one from 1980 by the Bloodroot Collective. Um, so this is where they have their really long like introduction. And it's also um, divided by micro seasons, not just like fall, winter, spring, summer, but like three like seasons per those seasons, like early fall, you know? Um, but then I, they also like, here's their third one of that kind of series. Um, and then they also had like, these are kind of harder to find now, but they also have like reissues of like Best of Bloodroot and the Bloodroot Calendar Cookbook and the Bloodroot Vegan Recipes because over time they went from uh, kind of what I call like 1970s vegetarianism, which it was basically pescatarianism and had like fish and they take fish off the menu and then they're um, all vegetarian and then they become more and more vegan over time. Um, and so we also see that kind of transformation within a lot of the um, feminist kind of restaurants and cafes today. Almost all of them have at least a few vegan items, but some are completely vegan. I'm just looking at uh, Julie Enzer is telling us about Sister Pie in Detroit. So if we go yes. to WSA next year, we'll, I don't know if you've been there. We'll have to go check it out. Yeah, no, I'm so like the cookbook is amazing. Also, for folks looking for a good cookbook, everything in that cookbook works perfectly that I've made. So <laughs> if you're interested in getting your pie in a, and uh, some really good uh, scone recipes, that's a great one. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I was just thinking, and you know, that that first bonus bookstore I went into was a cafe, which I totally forgot was also a cafe. And they had a lesbian music duo have a music event at night there. So it was all those things in one spot. And so I was thinking about how you have to narrow it to make it manageable, but mm -hmm. all these spaces were simultaneous and often reinforcing each other. You know, I went to the Naya Press archives, she loved women's music and like she had all this stuff from uh, flyers and lesbian softball leagues and all these things mm -hmm. were in this larger ecosystem. And it's so hard to keep it all simultaneously, but it's so important to be reminded yeah. that it was part of this larger system. For sure. And like, you know, I know a lot of books do this, but like coining a term, but I use this term feminist nexus in the book. That's a bit different than network. And it's really about kind of like the local kind of community where, for example, like I got the term because the Boston Herald in 1976 was talking about Cambridge and a feminist nexus. And I was like, I love this term because there's the feminist credit union there was New Words Bookstore and there was Bread and Roses and they were always supporting each other, right? The Feminist Credit Union was financing a lot of the feminist projects. Um, Bread and Roses, instead of having tipping, had a jar for a women's softball league um, that they helped support and they had tip jars for like other, they weren't tip jars, they were jars instead of tipping that like supported other women's causes. You know, they'd collaborate on events. And you see this across, like, especially for some of the larger cities. So uh, I just want to make clear that my book isn't a coastal history because a lot of the kinds of um, books around kind of feminist organizing focus on the Eastern seaboard and like California. I talk a lot about the Midwest. There's some about the South, but there are just, there were fewer spaces in the South. 
um, for these examples, but I do talk about the South a bit, but there's like a lot of Midwestern uh, examples as well. Um, but uh, there's kind of somewhere feminist nexus in like San Francisco, for example, where they're, um, and in LA, where basically larger cities that had enough um, like people to support multiple kinds of businesses, those businesses would collaborate and have like, um, they would have, you know, a bookstore and a restaurant would bring like a, a performer in, or there are collaborations a lot also with um, quite a few like universities too. And so that was one of the thing too, is that, you know, when I started this project, a lot of folks assume that it would just be about like what was happening in major cities, but you also see, especially the coffee houses, but also the restaurants in kind of college towns, which aren't necessarily large cities, right? They can be like smaller towns, but there's a large enough kind of like student population to support these spaces. One thing that was really cool is that um, there would oftentimes be collaboration of like women's studies professors or like feminist professors who would get a speaker to come to campus, like a renowned kind of famous feminist celebrity speaker come to campus and give a formal talk and the university would pay the honorarium. And then the person would give a free talk at the local like feminist restaurant or feminist bookstore. And that's actually something I've tried to do myself is I usually try to like do a talk at the university and then at the bookstore or like library. Um, so I think that's like kind of a cool principle, of like different organizations working together. And um, they were really, really interconnected. And then the other way I found a lot of these spaces too was through going through thousands of feminist periodicals and lesbian periodicals, looking at articles and in their advertisements. So even if people couldn't necessarily actually visit a space, they would like hear about it in these articles. So that was really important too. Yeah, that's great. I'm gonna to try to squeeze in one more question. Before yeah, for sure. This is from Julie Enzer. So are there local or state policies that influence the feasibility of creating feminist food establishments? I understand the community foundations, but wonder if there are policies that foster these businesses. Yeah, for sure. So, okay, so in the book in the 70s and 80s part, I look a lot at like policies that actually prevented spaces from opening um, that kind of created like ways that made it really hard to get a liquor license or zoning laws um, or like ways of just making it really difficult um, for small business owners to kind of navigate municipal regulations. Um, things that can really kind of promote these spaces. And this isn't just for feminist spaces, but can be really important um, for small business owners from different marginalized backgrounds who might not have like um, law degrees and might not have, you know, like formalized business training can be like having like guides of like, here's the kind of paperwork you need to fill out. Here's like the the process to go through to get like the licensing in our town and like all these codes rather than creating all these obstacles of when a person shows up at like city hall with certain forms and they're like you've done the wrong forms and treating them terribly right and so there's ways to kind of create working groups that foster creating like local guidelines like oh you want to start a small business here's the steps here's like where financing can come from um some cities will have things to promote small businesses especially like queer small businesses or small businesses um, run by black or um, small business owners or um, people of color who want to start small businesses in which there's like some in, like lower loans like in the beginning or there's also kind of community grant programs. Um, and then there's also things like, uh, so I live in Montreal now. I've lived here for 10 years, even though I'm originally from the States, I'm from California. Um, and so there's also programs like if you sell a certain number of like local authors, it also like you got like benefits for doing that. Right. So there's ways to kind of foster community space in terms of mentoring. There's ways to have kind of formal regu like formal rules that kind of promote that. Um, and then the other thing has to do with like permits for events. So a lot of these spaces are are really focused on having a lot of events and community centered events. And there's ways that um like municipalities can put a lot of roadblocks in the way of having events right Re needing lots of paperwork needing lots of approvals versus having things like okay well if your event is smaller than a certain amount of people you don't need to go through this process or like or we'll have like different ways to make it that you don't need to pay a super huge fee that prevent you from ever doing this so i mean it really depends on where you live but there are a lot of different ways that 
um, communities can support this work. Alex, it's been so fun to talk to you. I could talk all night. I know we are, we're getting near our end, so I want to invite ER back. Uh, and thank you so much for, for being here. Everyone, thanks for your questions. Uh, if you thank have you so book, much, buy the book. No, it's, it's I, I can't wait to talk to you more about it. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you everyone so much for all of your lovely comments in the chat too. If my eyes ever seemed to go off to the side, I was just reading all your amazing comments. Thank you so much for mentioning different kind of emails and your own challenges with running your businesses. It's so good to have all of you here. I recognize so many folks in the chat. Um, I want to shout out our friends from Burdock Book Collective. Thank you for co-hosting this event with us tonight. Um, if folks haven't been to Burdock yet, uh, please go check them out in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, thank you to Jamie and um, our friends in Water Valley, Mississippi. Um, and of course, uh, y'all should buy books from them, from both stores all the time. Go visit them in person, buy from them online. Um, and if you would like to buy ingredients for Revolution, you can also buy it from Karis tonight by clicking this teal button at the bottom of the screen. Um, it, it does help us when you buy event books from us as well. So thank you. Um, and of course, tell your tell your friends um, about this book. Uh, the replay will be immediately available here at the same URL. So um, I know there's more folks from Bloodroot probably who want to um, watch this. So I know PJ, you emailed, and I just saw your email. Please tell other Bloodroot folks they can watch the replay of this. I'll be putting it up on our YouTube channel. And um, we'd love for more folks to get to watch this amazing event and, and talk to talk to you. And I would imagine, Alex, that you're down to do more public talks if folks are interested. So reach, reach out to Alex uh, because Alex worked on this book for 12 years and she gets to talk about it a lot. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. And I'm pretty easy to find online. Um, Alex Ketchum and um, a Ketchum 22. I'll pop it in the chat is my Twitter handle. Um, we'll see what the future of Twitter is, but <laughs> for now you can find me there um, pretty readily. And uh, yeah. And also check out the website to see the kind of larger directory. And there's also a podcast I did um, talking a bit about the book, but also talking with other scholars, activists, and artists who work on related topics too. So it's a great way to find other folks whose uh, work you might want to read or follow. Sweet. So, uh, and that's so available on your website? Awesome. All yeah. right, folks, go check it out. Um, well, Jamie and Alex, thank you both so much. This was really lovely. Stay thank safe. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me.